Hello. Welcome to our first week of Nietzsche. We are reading the genealogy of morals. Here, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background into some of the commitments that Nietzsche has and some of the reasons that it's a little bit challenging to read him. Nietzsche is a surprisingly tricky thinker, and he's tricky in a very different way from Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard was a very challenging person to read, right? He's writing in all these pseudonyms. They have different writing styles. You kind of can't exactly get what his position is, but it's clear that you can't get what his position is because he's writing in pseudonyms to begin with. And so he's like basically telling you my position is less clear than it might seem. Kierkegaard is also often using really challenging philosophical language to get his opinions across. Nietzsche is different because Nietzsche is a much more fluid writer than Kierkegaard. And this means that it's easier to read Nietzsche, but it's also easier to misunderstand Nietzsche because his position is often more complex than it appears at first glance. The genealogy is written in typical Nietzschean style as a series of aphorisms. So an aphorism is a short and punchy articulation of a position, and it often doesn't make a full argument, but rather makes a statement. Now, these aphorisms are relatively long, and there is a sort of through line of argument among them. And so it's a little bit different from a regular kind of aphorism, but wanted to flag that for you nonetheless, the style. Writing in aphorisms is often an indication that a philosopher is rejecting systematic philosophy. So whereas with Kierkegaard, we get the emphasis on pseudonyms as one indication that he's offering us different perspectives on truth rather than an entire system. In Nietzsche, we get the penchant for aphorisms. That said, this is one of Nietzsche's more systematic texts. And so you'll see that actually a lot of the parts that he's discussing are working together. Hence, Nietzsche's aim in this text, which is to provide a critique of moral values. He says that the value of our values themselves have to be called into question. That's on page 20. Basically, we've taken for granted that values are good. But when we take for granted that values are good, we are using values to evaluate values, we are involved in a circular argument or what philosophers call begging the question. So what we need to do instead is to bracket our judgments of good and bad or good and evil and try and trace the genealogy of morality. Nietzsche's method is genealogy in this text. And genealogy seeks to uncover the origins of things. But the origins, not just in a sort of empirical sense, like when did morality first emerge, but in a deeper philosophical, theoretical sense. What are the conditions of human life that bring about an emphasis on morality? What sorts of latent philosophical assumptions do we have to bring to the table in order for moral systems to get off the ground? Looking for empirical roots is what he sees as a problem of what he describes as the English psychologist. Nietzsche is writing at a time when psychology for the first time in history is splitting off from philosophy. So for most of human history, psychology was a branch of philosophy. But in the 1880s, there is an emergence of psychology as an empirical discipline. Psychology labs start to emerge. For instance, William James's lab is the first in the US and that comes on the scene in the 1880s. So Nietzsche is writing in a context where he's worried about the rise of empirical psychology because he doesn't think Think that's the whole story and he wants to preserve a place for philosophical genealogy. For one, he thinks that empirical psychology tends to underestimate the historical element of the human condition and the way that it becomes over time. So the folks that Nietzsche calls the English psychologists tend to think about the origins of morality in terms of the utility of non-egoistic actions or altruistic actions. So let's say that I give another person a piece of bread that I have. A psychologist might wonder, what is my motivation for doing that? Why am I taking away something that could be useful to me? The English psychologist that Nietzsche criticizes answer this question about the utility of unegoistic actions by saying that such actions are useful to society. 
So perhaps it's useful because I have extra bread, somebody else needs some bread, and if I give them some of my bread, then I will be helping to perpetuate the existence of the human species because that person can then go on to reproduce and so on. So here, the greater good is achieved by people's own self-interest due to a sort of evolutionary perspective. And then as we've gone on in human history, the English psychologists contend, we have forgotten that good ultimately reduces to useful. And we started to think about good as something in its own right. Nietzsche thinks that this is just really bad genealogy because there's no reason that we would have forgotten the origin of good in useful. He thinks that actually the origin of good is a lot darker, a lot seedier than the idea that good originated in what is useful to society. Another thing to be really clear about is that it's important to resist the idea that whatever Nietzsche critiques, he is condemning. A lot of times Nietzsche will use very charged language that might make you think, oh, noble morality, good, slave morality, bad. But I want you to be really careful about making those sorts of value judgments. In this process of genealogy, Nietzsche is often utilizing description, but he's such a potent writer that these descriptions often seem like they amount to value judgments. Nietzsche is concerned with questioning the historical becoming of the concept of morality and questioning its historical becoming is his version of genealogy. So I want us to think here about Nietzsche as diagnosing the conditions of morality's emergence rather than as condemning morality or in particular condemning slave morality. I think that's often a sort of easy read to take here. There's so many ways to read Nietzsche. There's sort of left-wing Nietzsche. There's a right-wing Nietzsche. There's a moderate Nietzsche. There are Christian Nietzscheans. Nietzsche is one of those thinkers that is very mercurial and open to different interpretations. So I just want to flag that from the get-go. 